Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another of our Thursday night weekly programs. It's fun to be able to offer these every week with um, some different speakers and give you some information you might not hear every day, which is my favorite part, hearing things about um, different parts of the battlefield or different parts of, from the Civil War around the country. And tonight we have another great speaker whom you all might recognize from a couple of his programs he's done um, earlier this year for us. I'm excited to have him back for, I believe it's the fourth installment this time. So um, for those of you that may not know, um, we're sitting, um, currently I'm sitting in the heart of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at the Adams County Historical Society. And what we do is we get to house over a million artifacts. We get to preserve the history of the county of the Battle of Gettysburg and a little bit of everything in between. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thanks for supporting the Historical Society. We are working on a new museum project, which is going to be very exciting. Hopefully we can have some in-person programming again when we get that open. I'm excited about that. Be able to welcome some of our speakers in person to look us in the eye again. Um, but for now, we're gonna be keeping this um, every Thursday night. Our free programming is gonna be here and available. Now, for those that don't know, there is a heart button in the, I think it's a red heart in the comments that will actually give you an opportunity to donate toward the Historical Society. Um, that would of course be appreciated as we're working on getting the project finished and working on preserving these artifacts. It's time for you to uh, have a piece of your own history and be able to claim some of that. So without further ado, I'm going to be uh, welcoming again, once again, our speaker, Jeffrey William Hunt to the platform. And uh, he is director of the Texas Military Forces Museum, the official museum of the Texas National Guard in Austin, Texas and an adjutant professor of history at Austin Community College. He has also served as the curator of collections and director of the living history program. At, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong. At the Admiral Nimitz National Museum of the Pacific War. <laughs> was that right? Yeah. Awesome. awesome. I didn't practice this ahead of time either. That was, <laughs> um, and that's in Fredericksburg, Texas. He's also the author of several books, one of which I believe he's gonna be talking to us about tonight. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Jeffrey William Hunt. All right, thank you. It's really good uh, to be with all of you. I've had the occasion uh, to uh, speak to your fine organization on uh, uh, past uh, in past months. Uh, I'm really glad to, to be here with you again. Uh, and as was pointed out, I will be talking about uh, one of the books in my series, my Meet and Lee series, uh, that looks at the Civil War in Virginia from the moment that Lee retreats across the Potomac following the Battle of Gettysburg through the end of 1863. And this is a period of the war uh, that has been mostly ignored uh, by history. Uh, everybody sort of, you know, just sort of uh, uh, pretends as though nothing of significance happened in the Eastern theater. Uh, in the six months following the Battle of Gettysburg, and the historians like to uh, either veer off to follow the battles around uh, Chattanooga and Chickamauga, uh, or to hit the fast forward button and leap from Gettysburg uh, to the start of Grant's Overland Campaign, uh, ignoring what two of the most famous and important armies of the war did uh, for half a year. Uh, and this leaves uh, a lot of people with the impression that they didn't do very much, that they simply licked their wounds recovered from Gettysburg and waited for Grant to show up and jumpstart things in the spring of 1864. And nothing, of course, could be further from the truth. These uh, two armies were very active uh, during this uh, period. Uh, and uh, this is why I'm writing a series of books about it. Tonight, we'll be talking about uh, the third book in that series, Mead and Lee at Rappahannock Station. Uh, the Rappahannock Station campaign was relatively brief, November 7th to 10th, 1863, but it is the first major offensive launched by the Army of Potomac uh, following the Battle uh, of Gettysburg. Uh, and uh, this, of course, flows in the aftermath of Robert E. Lee's Bristow Station offensive, where he outflanked uh, the Army of the Potomac under General George Gordon Meade uh, at the beginning of October of 1863. Uh, driving Meade back uh, on Centerville uh, and the outer defenses of Washington. Uh, and uh, that uh, campaign uh, came to an end uh, with the Confederate um, rear guard defeat at the Battle of Bristow Station on October 14, 1863. So we uh, did manage to drive uh, the Union Army back on its capital. 
but he failed to cut off and destroy a slice of it. And though Lee had wanted to linger close to the Potomac in the aftermath of the fight at Bristow Station, he recognized that Richmond uh, could not supply his army that far north. Uh, Northern Virginia had been uh, literally laid waste by two years of war. Uh, there was no forage for man or beast to be found uh, above the upper Rappahannock River. Uh, and so Lee decided that he would have to pull back uh, behind that stream. Uh, and as he did so, he destroyed the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. You can see a picture of that destruction here. The Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which you see on this map, was incredibly important because this was Meade's primary supply line, uh, his only supply line, in fact. So every uh, every uh, piece of, of forage, uh, all of the rations, all of the munitions, all of the other um, uh, thousands of sundry items that the Army of the Potomac needed to stay in the field uh, came down that single uh, track line. And if Meade could not use that railroad, uh, then he could not advance. And so by destroying the railroad, Lee intended to uh, slow any pursuit of his army as it pulled back behind the Rappahannock. Uh, and perhaps if he was lucky, repairs on that railroad would take so long that it would forestall a fall Union offensive. Uh, this, uh, of course, would turn out not to be the case. The Federals would repair the railroad within three, month, uh, three weeks' time, uh, and rapidly enough to uh, allow them an opportunity to launch a, a fall campaign. Uh, and by the end of October 1863, uh, railroad repairs had basically gotten uh, into the area of Warrenton Junction. And the Army of the Potomac was spread out between Warrenton uh, and the ONA with its cavalry deployed forward. And Lee's army had pulled back behind the upper Rappahannock River, which forms the northern and eastern boundary uh, of Culpeper County. Uh, the southern boundary uh, of that county being formed by the more or less east-west running uh, Rapidan River. Uh, this is exactly the same position the two armies had occupied uh, at the beginning of August when the Gettysburg campaign came to its conclusion. And uh, Lee now had to make a very important decision, and that decision was whether or not to stand and defend Culpeper County uh, or to pull back behind the Rapidan into Orange County as he had done in August uh, of 1863. Uh, and in, in making this decision, Lee had to consider the topography of Culpeper County, uh, which is a very beautiful uh, part of uh, Virginia, uh, but also a place that is fraught with military difficulty. So if we look at the, the to topographical realities of Culpeper, we notice I, again, that it's formed by uh, two rivers, uh, the upper Rappahannock, which forms the northern and eastern boundary of the county, the Rapidan, which forms the southern boundary. Uh, Robinson's River forms most of the western uh, county um, uh, border. Uh, but as you can see, uh, Culpeper sort of looks like a V laid on its side with its mouth opening up uh, toward the foothills that lead uh, to the, well, Blue Ridge Mountains uh, and uh, the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, the county obviously is narrower uh, on its eastern end than on its western end, but it's not very big. If you traveled along the Orange and Alexander Railroad from where it crossed the Upper Rappahannock at Rappahannock Station and then went down to where it crossed the Rapidan at Rapidan Station, that's only 23 miles. Uh, and so if an army is occupying what I call the Culpeper V, uh, it's always going to be in a place where there is a significant river not very far into its rear. And that reality is compounded by the fact that uh, inside Culpeper, you don't really find good defensive terrain. Uh, this uh, pretty open territory, uh, undulating, uh, very gentle hills. There are a couple of very steep and tall mountains, Pony and Cedar, uh, for example, some of them rising to a thousand feet in height. Uh, but nowhere in Culpeper could you find a spot where you could really anchor both ends of a defensive line. So if an army fights a battle uh, on the defensive inside Culpeper, one or both of its flanks is always going to be vulnerable to being turned. Uh, and if an army is forced to retreat after losing a battle inside Culpeper, it's not going to go very far before it's going to have to get itself over either the Rappahannock or the Rapidan rivers. And all of those rivers have lots of fords along them. They're crossed by bridges in only a couple of places, most significantly where the railroad uh, spans 
uh, those two streams. And these fords uh, are natural bottlenecks. They're funnels that an army has to uh, use that slow down its movement, uh, and make it vulnerable to attack by a pursuing force. And of course, if you have a significant rain upstream, these uh, fords can disappear entirely very, very quickly. Uh, and so there really wasn't a good spot uh, to make a stand inside Culpeper County. And this is why Lee had declined to do so at the end of the Gettysburg campaign in August. It's why Meade had retreated out of Culpeper County rather than stand and fight uh, in October. Uh, and so when Lee pulls back after the Battle of Bristow Station, gets his army behind the upper ramp and he has to make a choice. Is he going to hold this line uh, and run the risk of defending Culpeper County, or is he going to go back behind the Rapidan? Uh, and this would be more advantageous in a way because the high ground is on the south side of the river. Uh, so if you are in Culpeper County, uh, the ground inside Culpeper is lower than the ground south of the Rapidan, and by the way, also the ground north of the Rappahannock, and this would give an attacker a lot of advantage if he's pushing south uh, because he could mass his forces out of your sight and then lunge for one of the fords along the river uh, rather unexpectedly. So there were a lot of reasons why this might not be a good place to make a stand. And as Lee pondered his options, uh, the, he really only had two. He could pull back behind the Rapidan as he had in August, uh, and, but the Rapidan has a lot of fords, and if Lee spread his army out to defend as many of those fords as he could, uh, he would stretch it for a length of 20 miles. That's a very thin line uh, to be held, even though all of these fords in that sector are very heavily fortified. Uh, even stretching his army out for that distance, Meade would not be able, or rather Lee would not be able to defend uh, the lower fords of the Rapidan, fords like Germana and Ely's Ford. And so it would be possible for the Union Army uh, under Meade to cross those fords without any difficulty and either turn west to attack Me uh, Lee's army uh, before it could unite or to push south to try and get between Lee uh, and Richmond. And the only real response Lee could have to either one of those maneuvers would be to put his army on the road and march eastward very rapidly with the intention of hitting the Federals uh, before they could accomplish either one of those goals. And if this looks familiar to you, uh, this is what's going to happen uh, to some extent during the Mine Run campaign uh, at the end of November, the beginning of December, 1863. And this is exactly what's going to happen uh, during Grant's uh, opening movements of the uh, Overland Campaign that are going to produce the Battle of the Wilderness. Lee did not like this option for a couple of reasons. One, it would force him to surrender all of the territory he had regained in his October offensive. And also uh, beyond that, it also put him in a reactive state. He would have to be sitting here waiting for the Federals to make their move and then hoping that the weather and the roads were good enough for him to make the kind of rapid march that would be necessary to intercept federal columns crossing the Rapidan. And so Lee preferred a second option, which in many ways was more risky, and that was to hold Culpeper County. But how do you hold Culpeper County uh, if the enemy has the advantage of high ground on its northern bank, and there's no good defensive position inside Culpeper. Now, to be sure, Culpeper has certain advantages uh, for the Confederates if they are intent on launching a strategic offensive. It's a great jumping off point to move toward the Loudoun or the Shenandoah Valley. And inside Culpeper, Lee would have something of an interior line position so that if the Federals attempted uh, to swing west, go through Madison County and maybe angle down toward Gordonsville, uh, where the Virginia Central Railroad meets the Orange and Alexandria and, and ultimately uh, carry supplies from the Shenandoah Valley uh, to Richmond, Lee would be in an excellent position to intercept that move. But if he's going to stay here, how does he negate the advantage the Federals have because of the high ground on the north bank of the river? And what Lee decides is possible is to hold this line by establishing a bridgehead on the north bank of the Rappahannock at Rappahannock Station, where the ONA uh, used to cross 
the, the river. The, it doesn't anymore because the Federals had burned the, that railroad bridge during the retreat in October of 1863. But if Lee holds a bridgehead here, then he negates the topographical disadvantage of staying in Culpeper County because from this bridgehead, he could threaten to launch an offensive against the Union Army. So if Meade tries to swing west, Lee could either intercept that movement or he could attack out of his bridgehead and get the Army of Northern Virginia between Meade and Washington. Likewise, if the Federals tried to settle down toward Fredericksburg, Lee could make the same move, attacking out of the ridgehead uh, to get astride the ONA and cut off Meade's line of supply, get between him and Washington, force the Union Army to turn around and attack the Confederates on ground of their choosing. If the Federals did not attempt to outflank that position, then their only other option would be to send enough troops to seal off the Confederate bridgehead, and this would be a significant part of their army required to do this, and, and keep the rebels there pinned up while the other half of the Army of the Potomac crossed the upper Rappahannock lower down, <clears throat> probably Kelly's Ford, where North Bank positions gave them a significant advantage. But this is what Lee would want me to do. So if he can hold part of Meade's army, maybe even as much as half of it in front of Rappahannock Station, uh, then he would let the other half cross at Kelly's Ford, uh, come in uh, to Culpeper County just a few miles, and then me, Lee could throw the bulk of his army against this portion of Meade's that had gotten over the river and destroy it in an overwhelming counterattack. So by staying in Culpeper County, uh, courtesy of a bridgehead at Rappahannock Station, Lee would actually allow himself to go over to the offensive. He would not be completely reactive as he would be if he went down below the Rapidan. He was actually concocting a scheme that would allow him to have an offensive defensive uh, if you prefer. Uh, and so this is the plan uh, that Lee uh, decided upon. He would keep his army here uh, between the river and Brandy Station, AP Hill's Corps uh, uh, off uh, on the left flank, uh, Richard Yule's Corps uh, holding the river line, and he would see if Meade would be willing to divide his army in order to attack uh, the Confederates in Culpeper County. Uh, Meade, of course, uh, can look at a map too, and he realizes that his options are pretty much the ones that Robert E. Lee uh, has has recognized. He could make a march uh, to the west through Madison County, aiming to either a strike toward Gordonsville or perhaps turn uh, toward Culpeper Courthouse and attack the Confederates uh, inside Culpeper County. But the difficulty with making this move is twofold. One, Lee would be able to intercept it very quickly and probably therefore dictate the terms of engagement. And secondly, by making this move, Meade would have to let go of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and rely on supply wagons uh, to feed his army. And that would slow him down. Uh, his line of communication would become very vulnerable to Confederate attack. And so this really wasn't a plausible act, uh, uh, option. Uh, Meade could try to make a rapid march uh, from Warrenton Junction down to the Lower Rappahannock at Fredericksburg, cross the river there by a pontoon bridges and get uh, onto the high ground south of Fredericksburg before Robert E. Lee uh, could intervene. If he could make this move very quickly and make it with some secrecy, uh, he might be able to carry it off. And if he got down to Fredericksburg and seized that high ground south of town, uh, then he would be able to uh, basically be on Lee's line of supply. And Lee would have to abandon the upper Rappahannock and the Rapidan and retreat down uh, to uh, the South Anna or the North Anna River to get between Meade and Washington. The danger, of course, in making this move uh, is that things could go awry as they had done in November of 1863, uh, I'm sorry, November of 1862, uh, when Burnside had made this exact same move at the start of the Fredericksburg campaign. So there, there, was, there was danger here, but Meade believed uh, that he could uh, make this move, make it quickly enough uh, and make it competently enough uh, for it to succeed. His only other option would be to launch a direct frontal assault against the Confederate defenses along the upper Rappahannock, uh, and that would entail doing exactly what Robert E. Lee wanted him to do. He would either have to uh, shield 
uh, and seal off the Rappahannock Station bridgehead to prevent the Confederates from attacking Alabit or strike the fortifications there, uh, which would be an operation uh, of dubious viability. It is all altogether uncertain whether the Federals could take the Confederate defenses uh, shielding their Rappahannock Station bridgehead. Uh, so uh, although he could attempt an attack, he would certainly have to send enough troops there to give it a chance of success, uh, certainly send enough troops there to prevent the Confederates from attacking out of the bridgehead, which would mean uh, putting about half of his army in front of Rappahannock Station. And if the Confederate fortifications there stymied that half of the army, then the only way to get at Rappahannock Station would be to attack it from the rear, uh, which would be to cross at Kelly's Ford, where the North would have all of the topographical advantages and then move up to strike Rappahannock Station from behind. Uh, either way, this involves dividing the Army of the Potomac and allowing half of it to walk into uh, a trap that Lee has set because Meade realizes that as soon as he gets part of his army over here, Lee would be free to concentrate most of his army uh, to attack the federal interlopers who've come over at Kelly's Ford and uh, try and destroy them before they could help the Union force at Rappahannock Station. So looking at these options, Meade believed that the Western plan was a non-starter. He didn't like the idea of the attack on uh, Rappahannock Station because it would force him to split his army and play Lee's games. What Meade wanted to do was to make this rapid march to Fredericksburg, counting on getting there and getting over the river before Lee could launch an offensive out of Rappahannock Station. Uh, and if Meade took his army uh, down to Fredericksburg, he could abandon the Orange and Alexandria as a line of supply. And he's never liked to the ONA. Uh, for his communications because it runs entirely through Confederate territory and that territory uh, is filled with rebel guerrillas and to keep those guerrillas from disrupting the ONA, uh, he has to spend uh, 5,000 infantry to guard the whole length of the railroad and that of course reduces his combat power. Uh, and so if he shifts over to a quiet landing, uh, then he is uh, going to have a much shorter and much easier to defend a railroad line of supply, uh, only 15 miles uh, run between a quiet landing on the Potomac River uh, and, and Fredericksburg. And so this would better position the Union Army for an advance on Richmond. And only an advance on Richmond would force Lee to stand and fight on ground that he would perhaps prefer and not to defend. Uh, and so to me, it makes perfect sense to make this lunge down toward Fredericksburg. In fact, he's wanted to make that move uh, for quite some time. He had proposed it back during the summer uh, and Lincoln uh, and his uh, general in chief, Major General Henry W. Halleck had rejected the proposal for a number of reasons. And one of those reasons was that they uh, didn't want to send the Army of the Potomac back to the scene of its worst disaster uh, less than a year uh, after that had uh, taken place. Also, they believed that this is merely transferring difficulties from one point to another. As far as Halleck and Lincoln are concerned, the job of the Army of the Potomac is to go out and fight and fight the Army of Northern Virginia and to destroy it. Doesn't matter where that happens, so long as it does happen. And surely this will be no easier to do somewhere around Fredericksburg than it would be somewhere along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. So they had said no uh, in the summer and that had forced Meade to stay on the ONA. And in mid-September, he wound up inside the Culpeper V and though he warned that it was a vulnerable position that Lee could easily outflank, uh, that was where he was stuck by the dictates of Washington. And then in October, Lee had launched his offensive, outflanked the Federal Army, uh, forced it to retreat out of the Culpeper V, almost back to the gates of Washington. And therefore, Meade believes that his uh, prescience has been vindicated. He, he had told his superiors this is what was likely to happen. Then that is exactly what had happened. And therefore, there had been this embarrassing retreat uh, all the way back to Washington, D.C., and now Meade believes that surely Lincoln and Halleck are going to see the logic of his proposal for a rapid shift to Fredericksburg and a change of the Army's base to a quiet landing. Uh, in this regard, uh, Meade is wrong. Uh, so he actually prepares uh, to move toward Fredericksburg. He puts the wheels in motion, orders pontoon bridges to be made up to cross the Rappahannock at Fredericksburg. He's going to avoid the mistake that General Burnside had made in November of 1863 by not ensuring that those pontoon bridges are ready uh, when he needs them. 
uh, and he sends word of his plan to General Halleck in Washington, asking only uh, that he be given prompt notice if the proposal is going to be rejected. And that prompt notice came very quickly. Uh, Lincoln and Halleck have not changed their minds about this uh, idea. They're still opposed to it. And, and this infuriates me. He writes his wife a very bitter letter uh, complaining that his plan is disapproved. The, the, those uh, are his capitalizations, uh, not mine. Uh, and he's really put out. He's never really seen eye to eye with Lincoln and Halleck and Secretary War Stanton. Uh, they have forgiven his uh, inability to destroy Lee after Gettysburg and his allowing the Confederates to retreat across the Potomac River, but they've never forgotten it. They, they do not think that Meade has the necessary aggressive instincts that will be required uh, to ultimately destroy Lee and his rebel army. And so they are adamant uh, that we are not going to have a change of base. You're not going to go to Fredericksburg. Uh, Lee's army is right in front of you. Go out and fight him where he is at. Uh, and to me, this not only flies in the face of military logic, it's also uh, rejecting his professional judgment, uh, and that pains him a great deal. And he believes that if he doesn't have the confidence of his superiors, if they're not going to allow him to move and fight the army uh, as he thinks best, then perhaps they ought to find somebody else to command the Army of the Potomac. He's, he's offered to step aside on several occasions, and of course, uh, those offers have always been rejected, uh, but one wonders how much longer uh, Meade's tenure can continue uh, under these circumstances. Nonetheless, Meade is a good soldier, uh, and he does not let his personal uh, feelings get in the way of doing his duty. He has orders, and he's going to follow those orders, and his orders are uh, not to go to Fredericksburg, uh, but to go after Lee where he's at, and there's only one way to do that, and that is to play the game exactly the way that Robert E. Lee wants to play it, and so Meade has no choice but to divide his army for a dual attack at Kelly's Ford and Rappahannock Station. Uh, the uh, army is uh, sliced into two wings. Uh, the right wing will be under the command of Major General John Sedgwick. He will have his own Sixth Corps, as well as Major General George Sykes' Fifth Corps, uh, about 26,000 men uh, plus supporting artillery. The left wing of the army will be given to Major General William F. French, who will have his own third corps, uh, and the second corps under newly promoted Brig Major General Governor Warren, and the first corps under Major General John Newton, about 29,000 men uh, with supporting artillery. Sedgwick and French are the ranking Major Generals in the Army of the Potomac, uh, and that's why they get these, these particular jobs. And so, what is Meade's plan? His plan is to move very quickly at dawn on November 7th, 1863, sending the 5th and the 6th Corps against Rappahannock Station, while the 2nd and 3rd Corps move against Kelly's Ford, and the 1st Corps goes over uh, to uh, stand in uh, reserve uh, at uh, um, Morrisville right here so that it can uh, move either to reinforce Sedgwick or French as circumstances require. Uh, the only way to negate Lee's plan uh, is to uh, strike at and destroy the rebel fortifications at Rappahannock Station at the same time that French is getting over the river at Kelly's Ford. And if you do this, then the army can rapidly unite, probably near Brandy Station, uh, and uh, spend as little time as possible being divided. And if you can get over the river at both places, unite the army, uh, then you'll be able to uh, have a fair fight with Lee. He won't be able to throw most of his army against a fraction of the Army of the Potomac. So a great deal depends on Sedgwick being able uh, to smash the rebels at Rappahannock Station. If he can't do that, uh, then Meade knows that French is going to be vulnerable uh, to a Confederate counterattack, and the only way to, uh, to lessen the odds there would be to rapidly shift forces from Sedgwick over to French during the night uh, of November 7th hoping to reinforce him in time to withstand the Confederate counterattack, and also crossing your fingers that a weakened Sedgwick uh, will be able to pin the Confederates inside their bridgehead uh, instead of having the Confederates bust out of that through Sedgwick's thinned lines uh, to cut the Army of the Potomac off uh, from Washington. So what Meade is doing here is not his first choice, it's his second choice, uh, and he has doubts 
about whether or not this is going to work. And on the eve of launching his offensive, he writes a letter uh, to his wife, Margaret, uh, who is a very close uh, confidant. He tells her uh, that he's in an embarrassing position uh, in what he wants to do has been rejected. Uh, and now he has to make a movement in which he uh, is not overly sanguine of success, but it's the only thing that he can do. If this doesn't work, he doesn't know what else he can try. Uh, and that has left him, as he says, uh, in a horrible state of anxiety. Uh, he says that he's in such a mental condition that he's not fit to write. This is why he hasn't written Margaret uh, for some days, quite un uncharacter uh, uncharacteristically. Uh, and uh, he reflects that, you know, he thought he knew what it would be like to take command uh, of the Army of the Potomac, uh, uh, but the, the reality of that job, the difficulties, the frustrations that are involved in it are far worse than he had expected, and he bitterly regrets that he had not absolutely and firmly declined the post uh, when he was ordered to it, but he had been ordered to it, and this is the essence of George Meade. He'd been ordered to it, and as a good soldier, his duty uh, was to obey orders, and uh, he had taken the job, and he would continue in the job until he was, as he believed, inevitably uh, uh, removed from it. And as long as he is in the job, he is going to do his best, even if he knows that his best is unlikely to ever satisfy Lincoln, Halleck, or Stanton, or a good chunk of the Northern uh, press, uh, for that matter. Uh, and this is, this is key to understanding George Meade. Uh, he is a dutiful soldier. And even though he is being forced into an operation that he believes is of doubtful viability, he is going to give his all to trying to make that operation work. Uh, a lot of other generals might have thrown up their hands when they were told they couldn't follow the plan that they preferred uh, and, and delayed and uh, found reasons not to uh, undertake an offensive uh, movement. Uh, or they could have undertaken that offensive movement so half-heartedly that they all but guaranteed that it would fail. But Meade is a much, much better man than that. And so he's going to give this all. He's going to give, be careful. Uh, he's going to lay his plans well, uh, and he is going to do the best uh, that he possibly can under the circumstances, trusting to God uh, that it is all going to work out uh, for the best. And so a, a divided Army of the Potomac uh, marches early in the morning of November 7th toward the upper Rappahannock River, Sedgwick heading toward Rappahannock Station uh, with his wing, French heading toward Kelly's Ford at his wing. And Kelly's Ford uh, draws its name from the village of Kellysville, which lay nearby. This used to be uh, the biggest manufacturing center in Culpeper County uh, before the war. There was a clothing factory there. Uh, there was a mill uh, and all sorts of other little small businesses. The, the factory uh, equipment had all been moved away early in the war. And although the mill is still in operation, uh, its, uh, its workforce is greatly reduced uh, by the needs of the Confederate Army. It's sort of operating at a reduced capacity. Uh, but it is here at Kellysville, uh, and this drawing is made after uh, the fighting on November 7th. It is here at Kellysville, the first fighting of the Rappahannock Station Offensive is going to uh, take place. Uh, this sector of the river was lightly held and for good reason. You can see these, these hills on the north bank that utterly dominate Kelly's Ford uh, and Kelly's Ville. And uh, the Confederates knew that they could not hold this sector. Uh, there's 700 yards of open terrain uh, beyond the river. The Federals get artillery up here, they'll utterly dominate it. And so all that the Confederates can really do here uh, is delay a Union advance, and that is all that they are planning to do. So there are fortifications at Kelly's Ford. Uh, they would be sufficient to fend off federal harassment or a minor probe, but against a major offensive, uh, they're not going to be of much utility. Uh, and as a consequence, the rebels have only one regiment uh, stationed right along the river, and that's the 2nd North Carolina. Now, that's usually under the command of Colonel William Cox, uh, but Cox is now commanding Ramseur's brigade of Rhodes Division of Ewell's Corps because Stephen Dotson Ramseur has gone home to get married. So Cox has stepped up to command the brigade, and that leaves Lieutenant Colonel William Stallings in charge of the 2nd North Carolina. He's got uh, 10 companies 
Uh, but one of those companies is up here at Wheatley's Ford. Two others are further downstream. So he's only got seven companies for about 225 men actually located at Kelly's Ford. Uh, Ramsey's Brigade is about a half a mile away in its camps, uh, but closer to the river uh, is the 30th North Carolina under Lieutenant Colonel William Silders with about 500 men and the Fluvanna Artillery under Captain John Massey, uh, which has six 12-pounder Napoleons. So six guns instead of four, as is usually the case uh, with Confederate artillery. Uh, they're there to support Stallings, but remember the idea here is to simply delay the Federals long enough to give Rhodes Division time to form line of battle uh, and to uh, put uh, Major General Edward Johnson's division of Ewell's Corps on the road to come up and reinforce Rhodes. In other words, the Confederates here have a well-formulated plan for how to deal with a federal crossing at Kelly's Ford, delay long enough to allow a line of battle to be formed, let the Federals cross here, basically walk into the trap, and once they get a couple miles away from the river, uh, they're going to run into Rhodes, they're going to run into Johnson, they're going to hold them in place until Lee can bring over the bulk of his army uh, to launch a counterattack uh, against whatever portion of Meade's has walked into this cul-de-sac. Uh, so there's not supposed to be a prolonged and determined defense of the Ford. Uh, this is a holding action. It's a holding action. And it's a holding action uh, that is, of course, ultimately doomed to, uh, to fail because the Federals uh, are well aware of the topographical advantages they have at Kelly's Ford. And so the first thing they do as they advance their infantry on the Ford is to put artillery up here on the high ground overlooking the river. Uh, the uh, famous uh, war correspondent and artist Alfred Wode uh, from Harper's Weekly is on hand uh, to watch the fighting at Kelly's Ford. And this is a drawing he made of the federal guns on that high ground uh, firing down on the rebels. And you can see the advantage that they have here. So here's Kellysville right there. Uh, this is that 700 yards of open ground. These woods here are the camp of the 30th North Carolina and the Fluvanna artillery. And there's a little earthwork here that the Confederate artillery had built, uh, was unmanned when the battle starts, uh, but the Fluvanna artillery is gonna come out and occupy it. But for the Federals, this is like shooting fish in a barrel. They completely dominate uh, the position. Uh, and so this battle is kind of a foregone conclusion. Uh, Colonel Stallings uh, puts his men uh, into uh, the earthworks. Uh, they manage to stymie the Federal infantry as it comes down uh, on the river. The Federal infantry is led by the first and second U.S. sharpshooters who form a skirmish line along the river. Uh, and uh, they force the Federals to ground. The Yankees bring up their artillery. They begin to pound the position. And at that point, the Fluvanna artillery comes out and takes up uh, its post in these earthworks. Uh, but the Federals move a third battery into place. And now it's 18 Yankee guns against six. And the Fluvanna artillery, after firing only about 10 rounds per two, uh, is forced to withdraw from the field. Uh, Colonel Sillers, very gallantly, but somewhat foolishly, decides to try and reinforce Stallings at the Ford. And he tries to move his 500 man strong regiment at the double quick from the woods across 700 yards of open ground uh, down to Kellysville. A Union artillery course takes him under fire. It's a very long uh, space to uh, jog uh, and the, the ground is not uniformly smooth. So the regiment begins to break up uh, due to the terrain and obstacles like fences in its path. And by the time it gets down into Kellysville, it's pretty much demoralized. And a lot of its men tumble into cellars uh, and uh, into buildings to take cover uh, rather than join the battle. And so, so uh, little support is Stallings getting uh, from the 30th that he tells Sellers, yeah, your men are contributing nothing but casualties, get them out of here. And Sellers, uh, frustrated from failing to be able to rally his troops agrees, and he leaves most of his regiment back uh, into the woods, uh, making that long, difficult run a second time under artillery fire. Now, about 180 men from the 30th North Carolina refused to retreat, and they, they continue to shelter in the buildings of, of Kellysville. Uh, General David Burney is in charge of the lead division uh, that is pushed down toward the river, uh, and uh, he recognizes that artillery is not going to drive 
installing North Carolina's way. So he orders the first U.S. sharpshooters under Colonel Casper Tripp uh, to make an assault. Tripp very prudently declines uh, making a direct frontal attack over the river into the teeth of the rebel defenses. So he sends four companies downstream uh, to cross the river at a more lightly defended spot. Uh, they get over uh, and with uh, a, a little difficulty, but they get over and then they, they turn the Confederate flank and attack uh, the rebels in the earthworks, and that's the, the cue for the rest of the first U.S. sharpshooters to storm across uh, the river, uh, and uh, here is Wode's drawing of it. Uh, they managed to take the earthworks in bitter hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, Stallings is forced to pull what's left of his men back to Kellysville, uh, and having retreated back to Kellysville, uh, and have, after losing the ford, there's no reason for them to stay. Uh, they've done what they needed to do. They've held the Federals in check for a couple of hours. That's given Rhodes time to form his line of battle. Uh, Johnson is already on the way to reinforce him. And so Stallings uh, leads his men back into the woods. And that uh, brings the Battle of Kelly's Ford to a conclusion. Uh, the Federals have lost seven dead, 35 wounded. The Confederates had 45 killed, 78 wounded and about 295 men missing, most of them prisoners, uh, the majority of them uh, from the 30th North Carolina. Uh, when Stallings pulled out of Kellysville, uh, about 40 men from the 30th uh, retreated with the 2nd North Carolina, uh, but 140 or so stayed in Kellysville and were captured uh, when the Federals uh, moved in. Uh, so a very cheap cost, the Federals get Kelly's Ford, they get Kellysville, uh, the Union engineers come up and begin to lay down pontoon bridges, and French begins to cross troops over the river. Uh, so this is satisfying, but of course this is exactly uh, what was expected. Lee wanted the Federals to cross at Kelly's Ford and walk into his trap. Uh, and so everything now comes to focus on what Sedgwick is going to do at Rappahannock Station. This sector of the river, uh, like Kelly's Hill, is under uh, the command of Major G uh, Lieutenant General Richard Ewell, uh, who has the Confederate Second Corps. Uh, Rappahannock Station, remember, uh, matters because this is where the Orange and Alexander Railroad uh, crosses the river. If Meade is going to continue an offensive against Lee, he's going to have to rebuild this railroad bridge, which was burnt in October during the federal retreat. So he has to have this spot on the river uh, and the Confederates, of course, are here because they are occupying high ground right next to the railroad on the north bank of the river. So this is where their uh, bridgehead is. Uh, here's a look at the area. These pictures are taken uh, in August of 1862. So there's the railroad bridge, and we're looking at it from the south bank uh, toward the north bank. Notice how open the ground is here east of the railroad. Uh, and this is Rappahannock Station. Uh, itself. All of these buildings have been burned uh, by November of 1863. None of these structures uh, still exist at the time of the November uh, battle. So it is the 6th and the 5th Corps that are coming up against Rappahannock Station uh, while French has moved down to attack Kelly's Ford. And with Sedgwick in command of the right wing of the Army of the Potomac, that means that the Sixth Corps is now led by Major General Horatio Wright, uh, who has relatively limited combat experience. He commanded a division at the Battle of Secessionville in 1862. And other than that, he's not really seen any action. You know, he was not with the Army of the Potomac during uh, the Gettysburg Campaign. The Fifth Corps, of course, is under the command of Major General George Sykes, who had assumed that job uh, at the end of June 1863, when Meade was elevated from Fifth Corps Command uh, to the job of running the Army of the Potomac. Uh, facing the right wing of the Union Army is a single Confederate brigade. Uh, the way that you'll have this uh, worked out, uh, he kept a brigade inside of the bridgehead for a week at a time. And uh, brigades from each of his divisions rotated in and out of that spot. So just the day before, the famous Stonewall Brigade of Johnson's division had marched out of the Rappahannock Station bridgehead and the equally famous Louisiana Tigers uh, uh, of Rhodes' division, or rather of Early's division, uh, had marched into it. 
Uh, the Louisiana Tigers are under the command of Brigadier General Harry Hayes, a highly competent officer, uh, but Hayes is away on court-martial duty at the start of November 7th, so his senior Colonel Davison Penn of the 7th Louisiana is in charge, and fortunately for the Confederates, Penn is as equally competent as Hayes. Uh, there are only about 900 of Louisiana Tigers, though, after at Gettysburg in the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th Louisiana. And on the morning of November 7th, most of them are deployed well forward of the fortifications at Rappahannock Station. The 7th and 8th Louisiana and the 6th Louisiana are uh, anywhere from uh, about uh, 800 yards to half a mile in front of the river. And they're deployed for observation. Uh, they're out here uh, looking uh, toward the north. Uh, watching for any federal movement. There is a little smattering of Confederate cavalry vedettes here, uh, but no major Confederate cavalry force. Most of Stewart's troopers uh, are either spread out down toward Fredericksburg, uh, guarding against that shift uh, to the lower Rappahannock that Meade wants to make, or they're clustered around uh, Brandy Station uh, because the Confederates are having great difficulty getting forage up to other animals. Uh, they need to keep the horses and mules as close to the railroad as they can to facilitate feeding them as frequently as they can. Uh, so the Confederate infantry is doing the job of the cavalry here. 7th and 8th Louisiana, 6th are out in front. The 5th Louisiana is holding entrenchments on the south bank of the river. And that means that only the 9th Louisiana and uh, the Louisiana Guard Artillery are actually in the fortifications. Uh, so 900 Confederates, and here comes 26,000 federal troops, and the, the leading edge of them shows up at noon on November 7th. Penn instantly sends word back uh, that a whole lot of Yankees have suddenly uh, appeared in his front, and understanding that his little brigade is not going to be able to do anything to stop those federals, he pulls the 7th, 8th, and 6th Louisiana back into his fortifications. He brings the 5th Louisiana over the river uh, in addition. Uh, and he's only a skirmish line out there for observation, so he concentrates his forces. Uh, word rapidly goes back to Early, to Yule, and to Lee that the Federals uh, have appeared in front of Rappahannock Station. And the Confederates are taken by surprise by uh, Meade's sudden movement. One of Lee's best spies had been caught uh, at the beginning of November, and so courtesy of the high ground on the north bank of the river, the Federals have managed to make this move and catch the Confederates unawares, but the rebels respond very quickly, and they're aided by that fact that as Sedgwick comes up against Rappahannock Station, uh, he has in his pocket an order from Meade that tells him that he is to seal off the bridgehead, strike it, try and destroy it and get south of the river, if practicable, uh, as quickly as he can. But he's also got from me a very uh, detailed description of the Confederate fortifications for Atlantic Station, a warning uh, that they may not be susceptible to assault, and a caution to guard against the Confederate counteroffensive erupting from Rappahannock Station. Uh, and Cedric is therefore going to be careful. So uh, when he first shows up, he has no idea that he's facing only 900 rebels uh, and uh, uncertain of Confederate strength. Uh, he decides to do nothing until he deploys the entire strength of two federal corps. And that's going to take several hours. And those hours are going to give the Confederates a vital time to sort of regain their, their equilibrium uh, and get ready to resist uh, a federal advance. And this represents a great missed opportunity uh, for the, the, the Union Army, because if Sedgwick had gone forward with even a fraction of his command uh, when he first arrived, if he'd sent forward just a couple of brigades uh, or maybe the first division or two uh, that show up, uh, he would have been able to push uh, the Louisiana Tigers across the river uh, without a fight, uh, because the, the even when Penn draws all of his men uh, into the fortifications. He does not have enough troops to demand the whole line. In fact, the center of his line is held simply by skirmishers. Uh, and if the Yankees were to come at him, uh, retreat is his only option. Uh, Early has ordered his division 
uh, up toward the river. Uh, but the only real reinforcements that are close by are two batteries of Confederate artillery that are going to occupy uh, earthworks on the south bank of the river, uh, covering the single pontoon bridge that uh, leads into the bridgehead. And this is the, the only uh, means of egress uh, into or out of uh, the, the bridgehead. The river here is very deep. It's not fordable. And so this is, this is the only way to retreat into uh, or retreat out of or, or reinforce into uh, the bridgehead. So these uh, Confederates are very much on their own. They have just watched 26,000 Yankees begin to deploy in front of them. They know that there are only 900 of them. They're on the wrong side of the river with a single bridge as their only avenue of escape. Uh, and it, it's a very, very precarious uh, position. And psychologically, this is going to have an impact on the Confederate defenders that we need uh, to keep in mind. Uh, nonetheless, Sedgwick, unaware of rebel strength, is being very careful and uh, very cautious. And so he waits to deploy both the Fifth and the Sixth Corps. This takes several hours. Uh, and so it's not until three in the afternoon uh, that he's going to be ready uh, to move at the Confederates. And even then, his first advance uh, is made with uh, minimal force. So he's going to send forward skirmishers all along the line. Uh, their job is going to be to seal off the Confederate bridgehead. To support those skirmishers, he will advance a division on both sides of the railroad. And on the uh, west side of the railroad, that division will come from the Sixth Corps, uh, and it will be under the command of Brigadier General Albion Howe. On the east side of the railroad, there will be a division uh, under the command of Major General uh, Bartlett, and that's going to come forward in a column of divisions. This is a formation that the Federals are going to use throughout the fight. So each regiment uh, formed two companies across five lines of two companies each. So this is sort of like a human battering ram. This is the front. Uh, but the job of these divisions is really just to support the skirmishers. And on the west side of the railroad, to support the skirmishers in seizing the high ground that had been occupied by uh, the 7th and 8th Louisiana so that the Federals can establish artillery there and, and attempt to shell the Confederates out of uh, their bridgehead. Uh, so at 3 p.m., uh, Sedgwick makes his initial advance. The Confederate skirmishers fire and pull back into the bridgehead. The Union skirmishers advance uh, until they can seal off uh, the bridgehead. The 5th Vermont is detailed to swing over uh, and grab Beverly Ford and then move down the river against the Confederate right flank. Uh, Howe's division moves forward far enough to allow it to gain control of this ridge on which Sedgwick intends to put artillery. But Bartlett's division, uh, as soon as the uh, Fifth Corps skirmishers reach the river, uh, veers off uh, and takes cover on this high wooded ridge uh, or up against the railroad embankment. So this is another missed opportunity uh, for the Federals because if these two divisions had simply kept coming, uh, once again, Penn would have had no choice but to abandon the bridgehead and retreat across uh, the pontoons uh, into uh, the, the south uh, bank of the Rappahannock R River. And this, of course, would have facilitated George Meade's plans a great deal because everything was focused on getting over the river at Rappahannock Station uh, at the same time or close to the same time that French had gotten over the river at, at Kelly's Ford. So uh, Sedgwick has thrown away uh, two opportunities uh, to uh, complete his mission uh, without a fight uh, and to do so very rapidly. But once again, he doesn't know what he's up against and he's being careful. He's as worried about a Confederate counterattack as he is about launching uh, his own offensive. So now the Federals are uh, looking at the Confederate defenses at Rappahannock Station, and we should spend some time uh, considering what it is they see. Uh, this is a drawing from August of 1862 by Edward Forbes, because there have been fighting here uh, at the start of what would become the second Manassas campaign. And this drawing is made from about the same a ridge uh, on which uh, the Confederate skirmishers of the 7th and 8th Louisiana had been posted, the ridge just taken by Howell's division uh, and the position from which Union artillery 
is going to begin to shell the Confederate earthworks. So uh, over here is the ridge occupied by the Confederate fortifications. These two hills here are where the Confederate guns south of the river have just gone into battery. This is the Rappahannock here. And this line right here is the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Now remember the Confederates have torn up the railroad. There are no tracks on the line anymore, but the embankment uh, along which the railroad had been built is still there. Uh, these buildings belong to uh, what most people call Rappahannock Station. Uh, it's actually the village of Bowensville, uh, which is where the, the Rappahannock Station uh, is going to eventually uh, come into existence. Uh, all of these buildings have been burned. They, they no longer exist. Uh, the buildings up here on the ridge occupied by the Confederates have been burned too. Uh, and in their place now, the Confederates have a two-gun, a fully enclosed earthen fort anchoring their right and looking down onto uh, the railroad embankment. Then their fortifications are going to run 300 yards to another large redoubt that's in the center of their line. And then the Confederate line is going to snake back, uh, curving uh, as it does so, uh, back toward a bend in the Rappahannock River. Uh, about 200 yards uh, in front of the Confederate position, this is a pretty gentle slope actually, uh, is the Freeman's Ford Road that runs from Freeman's Ford off to the west all the way, ultimately six miles to Kellysville off to the east. And this portion of the Freeman's Ford Road, which you see right there, is actually slightly sunken. Uh, so it's sort of a natural man-made trench. So this is what the topography looks like uh, to the Federals, and there's about uh, 800 yards separating the Confederate fortifications from this ridge uh, that uh, we are standing on looking south toward the Confederate line. Uh, what exactly do the Confederate fortifications look like? This is vital to understanding the battle uh, that's about to take place. Interestingly, uh, no uh, map was made uh, for the official record uh, by either Union or Confederate officers who, who took part in this fight. Uh, and so we have lots of verbal descriptions, but no actual map of the battle. Fortunately, in my uh, research into this fight, I found two maps that were drawn by participants in the battle shortly after it was over, and they tell us a great deal uh, about the Confederate uh, positions and the approaches to it. Uh, the two maps differ in some respects, neither has a scale, uh, but it gives us a, a lot of vital information. So here's one that uh, shows there's the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Uh, there is the ridge that the Confederates are defending. There's your one pontoon bridge that uh, is the connectivity between the Confederates on the north and the south bank. Here's a little stream called Tin Pot Run that runs on the northern edge of the ridge that Sedgwick uh, has just seized for his artillery. Uh, Coerce is under the railroad and then bends back to flow into uh, the Rappahannock River. Uh, you'll notice that there is an outer Confederate work on the east side of the railroad. This is usually forgotten uh, in modern maps of the battle. It's about 160 yards long uh, and it is defended right now by the 6th Louisiana Infantry. It has about 186 men and it stretches from the railroad embankment, which right here is about 10 feet tall uh, to uh, allow the railroad to go over this low land toward the bridge uh, when the river is flooding. Uh, and it bends back to conform to the path of Tin Pot Run. So its flank is sort of refused. Over here on this side is the two gun Confederate fort, a uh, very small fort, no room for infantry in it, holding the right flank, then 300 yards of trench. Uh, that lead to the large redoubt, uh, which then uh, connects to a Confederate defensive line that bends back toward the, the river. Uh, this map over here, uh, drawn by a member of the 50th New York Engineers, gives us a little bit more uh, detail. So he shows that the railroad curves a little bit as it comes down to the river. There are your two Confederate, uh, sorry, there are your two Confederate forts uh, on the south shore. There's your small fort, your 300 yard trench, your large fort. Uh, and then you can see that the Confederate line, line actually zigzags. It doesn't make a nice, smooth, semicircular curve back toward the river. No military man would build a line like that uh, because it would 
not allow you to concentrate your fire against an attacker. So you dig these zigzags to allow crossfire. And the Confederate line has those zigzags. But what this map shows us that's particularly important, and you can see it right here, uh, is that uh, there is a road that comes up from the pontoon bridge uh, and exit the earthworks and goes north. And the whole reason this bridge had exist is because of that road. Because if you're going to launch an attack uh, against the Federals, you need to be able to cross the river and then move rapidly northward. And that's going to require a road for uh, wagons, for artillery, for ambulances, uh, and columns of infantry. And so you can't build a solid embankment across that road, you would render it useless. So uh, the Confederate line actually in two places is gapped to allow roads to pass through it. Uh, and to defend those gaps, the Confederates have built two small outer works uh, to cover uh, the gaps in the main line. If you've ever had to drive onto a secure installation, you got to zigzag through those barriers uh, to get up to a security checkpoint, you sort of recognize uh, what's going on here. Uh, and this is really the most vulnerable part of the Confederate line. It's right there in the center, uh, very close to the open back large redoubt in which the Confederates have two guns in the same way that they have two guns over here uh, in this small uh, fort. Uh, and the Confederate line uh, is also strengthened by the nature of the trench uh, between uh, the small uh, and the large fort. As you see here, it's a stepped trench. Uh, and if you're familiar with World War I battlefields, you would recognize this. The stepped trench uh, prevents the enemy uh, from getting into and shooting down its length. These, uh, these bends in it uh, make it uh, invulnerable uh, to enfilade fire uh, should the enemy manage to break into uh, the, the trench. And so this is the Confederate position, but remember that this line is not large enough. Um, uh, it is not uh, held uh, firmly uh, by uh, the Louisiana Tigers. They don't have enough men. So the first of Early's brigades that arrives on the scene uh, is sent into the fortifications to reinforce uh, the, uh, the uh, Confederates. Uh, and that brigade, uh, is under the command of Major Archibald Godwin. Uh, this is actually Hoke's brigade, uh, but Hoke is not with the, the, his command today because he and one of his regiments has been sent uh, to, back to North Carolina uh, to round up deserters. So the command is now under uh, Godwin, who is actually Virginian, and he's got three regiments, the 54th, 6th, and 57th uh, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, the 54th North Carolina is pretty big for a Confederate regiment at this uh, point in the war. And the reason for that is that it did not fight at Gettysburg. It, it was guarding Union prisoners taken at the Third Battle of Winchester on the advance into Pennsylvania. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, lack of experience at Gettysburg is, is going to turn out to be important, uh, and we should uh, remember it. And so once uh, Hayes uh, is reinforced by Hoke, and Hayes uh, shows up at this time. He's abandoned his court martial duty. He's raced to, to the front, and he, he, he gets into the bridgehead and takes over uh, from Penn. Uh, now the Confederates have enough men uh, to defend the whole bridgehead, uh, but Hayes' uh, brigade is divided with the 5th and 7th Louisiana holding the left flank. Uh, Godwin's three regiments fill in in the center uh, you've got the 8th Louisiana, which is holding that, uh, that gapped portion of the Confederate line and helping to defend the large redoubt. And then the 9th Louisiana holding the 300 yards of trench uh, between the large redoubt and the small fort. And then the, the isolated 6th Louisiana uh, over there on the left flank. And you can see that you have a solid line uh, of, of federal skirmishers uh, that are uh, holding uh, this position. Uh, uh, in, uh, in front of it. Uh, some of them uh, in, actually in the sunken uh, Freeman Ford Road and a few uh, forward of that uh, in a, and a little natural uh, drainage ditch uh, that is uh, sloping down from the Confederate fortifications uh, toward the road. This gives the Confederates about uh, 2,100 infantry and about 78 artillery uh, to defend uh, the bridgehead. And our rate against them are 26,000 Federals 
uh, in into core. Uh, the advance of hoax brigade uh, into the bridgehead had alarmed Sedgwick, who moved forward the entirety of the Sixth Corps uh, in case the Confederates attempted a counterattack, which of course they're not going to do. Uh, the, the Federals are therefore able to put uh, three batteries of artillery uh, on top of the ridge, just vacated by Confederate skirmishers. Uh, and they're, they're going to spend uh, about an hour and 45 minutes trying to shell the Confederates into retreat. This leads to a very traumatic artillery uh, duel uh, that inflicts hardly any casualties whatsoever, makes a lot of noise, uh, but is not even going to begin to persuade the Confederates to abandon their bridgehead and retreat. Uh, interestingly, the uh, General Early and General Lee are both on the spot. Uh, they're on the hill on the south bank where the Confederate artillery is. They're observing everything. Lee calculating uh, carefully how many Federals does he have in front of him. Uh, has me divided the Army of the Potomac in the way that Lee wants him to? And the answer seems to be yes. Uh, the Federals are showing no disposition to try to attack the Confederate earthworks at Rappahannock Station. Uh, and that means that night is likely to fall uh, with a stalemate uh, in place there, which is, of course, exactly what Lee wants. He wants his uh, bridgehead to hold as many Yankees in front of it as possible, leaving French vulnerable to an overwhelming counterattack uh, the next morning. Uh, Early has brought up the rest of his division. He's thrown one uh, brigade uh, off to watch Norman's Ford there uh, to the east. He's got Pegram's brigade uh, holding uh, in reserve. Uh, but Lee doesn't want him to send any more troops into the bridgehead uh, because he doesn't want to expose more of his men <clears throat> than is necessary. Not that the bridgehead probably could have hold, uh, held many more Confederates, maybe an extra regiment, but it's not a very big, big place. Uh, and so as we slide toward dark, uh, everything is pretty much working the way uh, that Lee wants it to. Neither uh, Sedgwick, nor Wright, nor Sykes is being inclined to launch an infantry attack across nearly a quarter of a mile of open ground uh, at a line of Confederate earthworks. And so it looks like the night is going to fall uh, and uh, the Confederate defenses at Rappahannock Station are going to be intact and Lee's plan of defense is going to be intact. Uh, unfortunately for the, the, the Confederates, that's not going to be the way it's going to work out because Brigadier General David Russell, uh, who is commanding <clears throat> the 1st Division of the 6th Corps uh, in lieu of Wright, who has, of course, stepped up for command, uh, has been up on the skirmish line, uh, and he believes uh, that he, in fact, uh, has an opportunity to seize these defenses. In fact, Albion Hall had seen it earlier when he had taken uh, control of this ridge uh, he sensed that the Confederates were weak, and he sent back and he begged uh, Wright for permission to storm the rebel lines, and Wright had refused, and we're not going to run that uh, chance. But now uh, it's a couple of hours later, uh, it's getting close to dark, and, and Wright has come up, uh, and uh, or Wright has uh, got a message from Russell uh, proposing to launch a dusk attack on the Confederate earthworks, and Russell's plan is very clever. So we have the federal skirmishers here, uh, and the skirmishers uh, from Russell's division are about 50 men from the 121st New York under the command of Captain John Fish, and then five companies of the 6th Main Infantry, uh, so about 150 men, and they're in this sunken road right in front of the large Confederate redoubt. Now, these skirmishers have been sniping at each other, uh, sharpshooting uh, at one another for a couple of hours. Uh, but now that it's getting to be dark, everybody is probably getting kind of complacent that this is, this is the way the battle is going to be when the sun sets. And Russell intends to use that to his advantage. So what he wants to do is advance the other half of the six main as a skirmish line over that ridge across this open ground uh, into the sunken road. And he knows the Confederates are going to see that but he thinks that the rebels will suppose that this is just the routine relief of one skirmish line by another, which is something that you would do uh, right before dark. But instead, uh, what Russell plans is that when he merges the six main together, uh, it is going to have 300 men uh, and it's going to fix bayonets and launch an immediate attack 
against the large redoubt. Uh, and as it attacks and keeps the Confederates busy here, the 5th Wisconsin is going to come forward uh, about five minutes behind the skirmishers of the 6th Maine and a column of uh, companies, a column of divisions, uh, and it's going to reinforce the attack on the redoubt. And then there'll be a third line of 119th Pennsylvania and the 49th Pennsylvania moving forward also in a column of uh, divisions. The 49th only has four companies, so it's much smaller. Uh, and they're going to slam into the same position. They're gonna take the large redoubt uh, and then take the pontoon bridge. And that's going to trap all the Confederates north of the river uh, and ought to lead to the bridgehead's destruction. Uh, why Russell is only using this single brigade when he's got a division is a question that's never answered. Uh, it probably results from the fact uh, that uh, he believes the Confederate defenses are much more lightly held uh, than they, they really are. Uh, the fact that this attack will be made uh, right at dusk uh, is, is key because it's going to prevent the Confederates from seeing the relatively small force and the narrow front uh, that is being used against them. Uh, and un, unknown to the Federals, this is also going to help play into uh, Confederate trepidation after seeing two Federal Corps uh, fan out in front of them earlier in the day. The Confederates are unlikely to think that the Federals are going to throw such a small force at them. They're, in fact, kind of girded against the possibility uh, that Sedgwick is just going to throw wave after wave of Federals across the entire Confederate front and overwhelm them uh, by, by sheer numbers. So the fact that this is going to take place uh, just as light is fading from the battlefield uh, is, is going to turn out to be very important and very helpful for Russell. Uh, because if this attack had been made in broad daylight, uh, it would have failed. The Confederates would have been able to accurately judge the size of the force that were being thrown against them. Uh, they would have probably shot this uh, attack apart uh, and driven it back. But coming out of the gathering darkness, the federal offensive is going to have an impact uh, out of all proportion to the numbers that are engaged. Uh, Russell uh, is going to count on his first two regiments, uh, Colonel Benjamin Harris, the 6th Maine with 321 men, Colonel Thomas Allen's 5th Wisconsin with 300 men uh, to do the heavy lift, uh, but they, in fact, would not have been sufficient uh, if Russell did not get uh, unexpected help. So uh, when the 6th Maine forms up and prepares to attack, uh, Colonel Harris gathers his men together, tells them to fix bayonets, to uncap their muskets so that they can't shoot uh, as they advance. And this is very important because if they, if men stop to shoot, it's very hard to get them moving again. Uh, and uh, they go to ground and your momentum is lost. So by uncapping the muskets, his men are forced to rely on the bayonet. And as this plan is being explained, Captain Fish of the 121st New York uh, overhears it. Uh, and he had been told by his brigade commander, Colonel Emery Upton, that the one thing he should be sure to do is keep up with the foremost advance. And since he's received no orders to the contrary, uh, it looks like the foremost advance is going to be this attack by the 6th Maine. So Fish, even though he thinks this is a rather desperate endeavor, uh, concludes that he's expected to take part in this attack too. And that's gonna matter a great deal because it turns out that his 50 men are gonna wind up striking the weakest part of the Confederate line. Uh, so uh, General Russell's going to have help from the 121st New York skirmishers, and unexpectedly, he's also going to have help from the 5th Corps skirmishers. And so remember that the railroad curves slightly as it heads toward the river. And as the 5th Corps skirmishers had advanced earlier in the day, part of the 20th Maine, which has about 70, 75 men on the skirmish line, because of this curve, wound up west of the railroad. Uh, where technically it's not supposed to be. And while the 20th Maine is here, sharpshooting at the rebels, just as the 6th Maine is, uh, Major Walter Morell, uh, who is running the 20th Maine skirmish line, had wandered over to visit friends in the 6th Maine. After all, these, uh, Maine is not uh, a big place. These guys are neighbors back home. And while he's visiting the 20th Maine, he eavesdrops on Harris, giving his instructions for the start of the battle, uh, and one of the six mains officers looks over at Morrell, recognizes him, and says, hey, you want to 
you want to go in with us? And Morrell uh, says, oh, I absolutely. And he runs back uh, to his men, about 50 of whom are on the west side of the railroad. And he says, boys, the six main is going to go in. Let's go in with them. So an extra 100 men here are going to be part of this uh, first federal attack. And in fact, that's going to trigger even more support because you've got 20, 25 men uh, from the 20th Maine who are over here on the east bank of the railroad with uh, connecting files up on the embankment uh, that allow the two halves of the main uh, skirmishers to know what's going on. Uh, and they see this part of the 20th Maine go forward and assume that orders have been issued that they haven't gotten. So they get up and they begin the advance and that triggers the 83rd Pennsylvania, 44th New York and 16th uh, Michigan skirmishers to believe that somebody's given orders that they haven't received and that they're supposed to advance to. So an additional 275 federal troops from the Fifth Corps are going to take part in this attack as well. And this additional support is going to be absolutely critical uh, to the success of Russell's attack. Uh, and so basically what happens is that uh, as the Federals uh, on the east side of the railroad move forward, uh, coming in from the gathering darkness, uh, there are 275 of them approaching 186 men uh, in the 6th Louisiana. Their commander, Colonel Monaghan, believes uh, that there surely isn't just a Union skirmish line coming at them. He had watched a whole federal division advance in his direction early in the afternoon, just inexplicably uh, halt uh, instead of continuing its advance. Well, now that division must be coming forward again. And there's no way 186 rebels completely cut off from the rest of Hayes and Hoke's brigades by this steep hill and this tall railroad embankment are going to be able to stop them. So Monaghan orders his men to move by their left flank, which gathers them together uh, here at the railroad embankment, and then to retreat across the river uh, where the stone pylons of the burnt railroad bridge are very much in evidence and where the river is just barely fordable. And about half of the 6th Louisiana manages to get over the river before the federal skirmishers get up here on the riverbank and begin to fire into their rear. Uh, the, some of the Confederates are shot in the back and fall into the river where they're going to drown. Uh, the federal skirmishers, as they're reloading, realize that they're not really uh, keen on shooting men in the back and they begin to yell at uh, about 75 or so Confederates are still trying to get across the river to turn around and come back and surrender. These men uh, turn around and uh, begin to follow those instructions, at which point one of their officers steps out from behind one of the bridge abutments, wielding a pistol and a saber, and orders them, no, turn around, head back toward the south bank. And these poor Confederates uh, proceed to follow those orders, at which point the Yankees start to shoot at them again, and most of the rebels are forced to hide behind the, the uh, stone pylons uh, until they can convince the Federals to accept their surrender. So about half of the 6th Louisiana manages to escape. The other half uh, is captured, and the whole right flank of the Confederate line uh, is destroyed in the opening moments of the battle. Now, these Federal skirmishers have also managed to, uh, to drive the gun crew away from one of the two Confederate cannon. Uh, in the small fort, which is going to weaken uh, its defense. Uh, this uh, scene, by the way, is drawn by Edward Forbes, who's there with the Fifth Corps, and observes the battle from the east side of the railroad. So this is an on-the-field sketch of the fight as it actually uh, played out. On the west side of the railroad, the 6th Main uh, advances at the double quick out of its sunken road, and, along with the 121st New York, and charges the Confederate fortifications. Unfortunately for the Federals, Hayes and Hoke's men had taken part in the twilight assault on Cemetery Hill on July 2nd, 1863 at Gettysburg. And so if there are any troops in the Confederate Army who are familiar with the danger of a twilight attack, it is these men. And so they are not taken by surprise. In fact, they pour a couple of very deadly volleys into the 6th Main, uh, which uh, goes to ground on the forward slope in front of the large redoubt, although a few Federals managed to get up and into the, the Confederate fort. Most of the 6th Main uh, it takes cover. Uh, its officers shot down, including Colonel Harris, who's taken a bad wound in the leg and is out of action. A lot of the Federals are crying out uh, that they surrender, and it looks like this assault has failed 
uh, completely. Uh, the 5th Wisconsin is supposed to be coming up to rapidly reinforce uh, the 6th Maine, but it has been delayed uh, because Colonel Allen had sent uh, it forward uh, with unloaded muskets. His men did not like that and complained loudly about it, began to load without orders, so he halted them and allowed them to load. But this threw his regiment five minutes behind schedule. And so it's late in getting up here to support the 6th Maine. Now, the 6th Maine, driven to ground, uh, has a bunch of men calling out to surrender, but others say no, no attack. And so some of them get up and they surge once more into the works, uh, but are driven out of them. And there's this nasty little fight going on along the edge of the parapet uh, when the 5th Wisconsin belatedly gets to the field and half of it swings up uh, to, uh, to the east uh, to uh, join the 20th Maine skirmishers who are attacking the 300 yards of trench uh, and the small fort right here. They come in and join that attack while the other half of the regiment joins the attack on the large redoubt. Uh, and a vicious hand-to-hand -hand fight breaks out here. Fortunately for the Federals, Captain Fish and his 50 men had struck the weakest part of the Confederate line. And because these parapets are very uh, uh, short uh, and the trenches behind them are very narrow. Fission and his men were able to jump onto them uh, and point the weapons down at Confederate troops who could not really aim well uh, uh, at, at their assailants. Uh, and Fish and his men ordered the Confederates to surrender and about 127 men of the 8th Louisiana give up uh, to 50 Federals. So those prisoners are hustled off to the rear and this breaches the Confederate line, forces the 6th and the 57th North Carolina to refuse the flank to try and protect the other end of the bridgehead. Uh, but this is going to prevent the Confederates from reinforcing the 8th Louisiana, uh, which is now in a very nasty hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, trying to hold the large uh, redoubt. And ultimately, they fail. The 9th Louisiana is forced back. The 8th Louisiana is forced back. The Confederate guns are captured. Uh, and uh, just at the moment uh, when uh, the the uh, Federals need it most. The 119th and 49th Pennsylvania arrive uh, to secure uh, the breach in the line. And now the entire uh, eastern half of the Confederate bridgehead uh, west of the railroad has been lost. Uh, the uh, remnants of the 8th and 9th Louisiana are kind of a mob down here. It's now almost completely dark. These Confederates are completely disorganized. They have no idea what's going on. And that's why three Yankee privates who run down here uh, in, in a burst of enthusiasm and fire their guns up in the air and demand a Confederate surrender are able to capture 170 rebels uh, who throw down their arms and are rapidly marched off uh, to uh, the rear. And this, uh, this surrender happens because, remember, the Confederate defenders are aware that they've got two entire federal corps out in front of them. And they can't imagine that the Federals are attacking them with such minimal force. There are, in fact, fewer attackers than there are defenders uh, on the evening of November 7th. But in the Confederate mind, this is just the leading edge of wave after wave after wave of Union troops that are going to be hurled against them. Uh, and knowing that they're not going to stop that kind of an overwhelming assault, there's a single bridge that would allow them to escape. The Confederate uh, will to fight uh, is, is mortally damaged here. Nonetheless, the Confederates have put up quite the battle uh, to hold this part of the line. And General Russell, who's been wounded in the foot, uh, realizes belatedly that he's bitten off more than he can chew. The Confederates here are much stronger than he had supposed. So he sends word back uh, to uh, Emory Upton to send forward two regiments to reinforce the fight on the large uh, redoubt. Uh, Upton leads them forward personally, the 5th Main 121st New York. Uh, but by the time he nears the, the front line, uh, the redoubt has been taken and Russell intercepts him and he says, what I need to do now is to uh, knock out the Confederates who are infilating my line from a salient uh, over to the west. And so Russell uh, deploys from a column of division in a line of battle, uh, puts his men in this drainage ditch, and then orders a attack against the Confederate defenders, which are the 54th North Carolina, the one Confederate regiment in the bridgehead that had not fought at Gettysburg, had not taken part in that dusk assault 
on uh, Cemetery Hill and are therefore most discombobulated uh, by a night attack. The 54th has also spread itself out thinly, trying to occupy part of the trench abandoned by the 6th and 57th North Carolina when they refused the flank following Captain Fish's breach of the Confederate line uh, where the road pierced uh, the rebel earthworks. And so uh, the Federals uh, are attacking upslope. It's dark. The 54th North Carolina fires at them, but shoots a little too high. So only a dozen or so of Upton's men are hit. And the Federals uh, strike the rebel line in full force. And after a brief hand-to-hand -hand combat, capture uh, half of the regiment, its colors, and its commanding officer. And so now the breach in the rebel line has been widened. Uh, and Upton, having gotten this part of the line, looks off to his right, sees that the Confederates are very disorganized over here, and he realizes that there's an opportunity to exploit uh, the, the success that he's just enjoyed. Uh, and so he, he is going to prepare uh, to uh, renew his assault, uh, even absent orders from Russell. Uh, Alfred Wode, by the way, uh, drew uh, a picture of Upton Strike on the 54th North Carolina. Uh, Wode remembers at Kelly's Ford, so he's not there to witness the battle. Uh, and so his drawing here in terms of the combat is very fanciful, but he did draw uh, the, the Confederate earthworks. And so you can see, again, the zigzag nature of them. There's the pontoon bridge. See how steep the ground leading down to it is. There's the small fort. There's the big fort, which have already been captured. Uh, by uh, the Federals at this point in the battle. And so uh, Upton's determined that he's going to renew his attack. Uh, and this is where he shows some real genius. So he leaves uh, one half of the 5th Maine to hold the works he's already captured. He sends one half of the 121st New York down to try and capture the pontoon bridge. Then he pulls the other two battalions of these regiments out of the Confederate line, forms them into a uh, column, uh, out down slope in front of the Confederate works where the rebels can't see them or shoot at them. And then he orders them to double quick along the front of the Confederate position, still down slope in the dark where they're relatively safe and halts them when they come adjacent to Confederate defenders. He fronts them and then in a piece of impromptu uh, psychological warfare, he shouts out loud enough for the Confederates to hear uh, that uh, we're going to attack when the rebels fire, you lay down because there are four lines of battle behind us who will charge over us to strike the rebel line. And this is heard by the Confederates uh, in the 54th North Carolina who've already lost their, their colors uh, and half the regiment. And uh, to them, it sounds perfectly believable given what they know about the mass of Union troops in front of them. And so when the 5th Maine and 121st New York charge forward, uh, they manage uh, to overwhelm the Confederates virtually with no resistance. And now another big piece of the Confederate line has fallen into Union hands. But at this point, Upton uh, has, has expended all of the, the force that he has. He can't do more. Uh, and so you still have the 5th and 7th Louisiana over here on the Confederate left. They've been firing at the 5th Vermont skirmishers. It's very windy. The noise is carrying away from the river. Uh, and in the darkness, these troops have no idea what's been going on uh, behind them or over here on the right. Uh, and so uh, they, they don't know that this part of the line has just been taken. Uh, some of the fugitives from the 54th North Carolina, however, are running over toward uh, the Louisianans. And Colonel Clark Edwards, the command of the 5th Maine, sees them dashing away and decides he wants to capture them. So he takes a dozen men in pursuit of these Confederate uh, uh, fugitives. Uh, and after a handful of yards, uh, Edwards unexpectedly runs into the back of the 5th Louisiana. And he realizes he's got himself in a very bad spot. He's got a dozen men. He's, uh, he's rather at a distance from his own regiment. There are a whole bunch of Confederates in front of him. And if they realize uh, how small a force Clark uh, Edwards has with him, uh, he and his men are probably going to be uh, shot down or gobbled up. So Edwards very boldly demands to know who's in charge of this part of the Confederate line. And Captain John Angel, uh, who is in charge of the 5th Louisiana, 
which only has 125 men, and he hears Edwards and he turns around and he says, I'm in command here, who wants to know? And Edward says, I'm Colonel of the Fifth Maine and I demand your immediate surrender. And Angel is taken aback by this. He had no idea that there were Federals inside the Confederate perimeter, let alone that they were behind him. Uh, and trying to you know, grasp what's going on, uh, he says, uh, well, give me time to consult my officers. And Edwards, understanding how dire a situation is, uh, continues his bluff. And he ups the ante. He says, no, I'm not going to give you a, a single second. I demand your surrender now. And Angel still hesitates. And at that point, Edwards throws his arm behind him and points to this moving mass of men in the darkness, which can barely be seen. And Edward says, those are my men and they're coming forward against you. And if you don't surrender right now, I'm going to order them to attack. Well, in fact, there were no federal troops moving up behind Edwards. These were Confederate prisoners that were being herded together and shuffled out of the line. Uh, but Angel can't tell who's wearing what uniforms and what's going on in the darkness uh, behind Edwards. And so realizing that his men are pointing in the wrong direction, that if these federals do in fact come at them, uh, they're going to be able to gun his soldiers down uh, and shoot them in the back. Uh, Angel agrees to surrender, uh, and when he gives up, then the 7th uh, Louisiana uh, has no choice but to surrender, too, and so Edwards has managed to bluff two Confederate regiments into uh, laying down their arms. This leaves only the 6th and 57th North Carolina still fighting. Uh, Godwin is in command of these two regiments, and Colonel Samuel Tate of the 6th North Carolina goes to him and says, look, this has gotten out of hand. Uh, everything is lost. We'd better fight our way uh, to the pontoon bridge and, and try and uh, reach safety. Uh, Godwin refuses. He says, I have no orders to retreat. I'm not going to retreat. We'll try and retake the position. But of course, by now, uh, he's hopelessly uh, overmatched. Uh, and ultimately, the Federals are going to come down and force the 6th and 57 North Carolina uh, to surrender as well. Uh, some Confederates are going to get across uh, the bridge and escape. Uh, officers and couriers or in horses have the best chance of doing that. Uh, but uh, ultimately, after just about 45 minutes of fighting, the bridgehead has been completely uh, destroyed, and 1,600 Confederates and four pieces of artillery, along with seven Confederate battle flags, uh, have been captured. Unfortunately for me, uh, this, uh, this success uh, has come too late. Uh, it's dark, uh, and by the time that Meade understands what has happened at rapid annexation, it's 10 o'clock, and Cedric can only tell him, I've taken the Confederate position, but I have not managed to get across the river, and at nightfall, there were still uh, lots of Confederates south of the Rappahannock. And so uh, as gratifying as that success at Rappahannock Station is, for me, uh, it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, his, he's still got uh, part of French's wing uh, on the wrong side of the river. Lee is still uh, able to concentrate against it and throw a massive counterattack in the morning. And therefore, uh, he's got to spend, uh, Meade has to spend the night of November 7th uh, reinforcing a French by shifting most of the troops away from Rappahannock Station down to Kelly's Ford. Uh, and he's uh, girding himself to face a threat, of course, that no longer exists, because having lost Rappahannock Station, he understands that his entire plan of defense uh, has been uh, voided. And so he orders his wagons packed up and sent toward the Rapidan. He gives uh, about half the night over to getting his wagons on the way. Then he pulls his infantry back from the front lines. Uh, to a ridge just a couple of miles in front of Culpeper Courthouse. Uh, he deploys Stewart's cavalry uh, along the probable axes of the federal advance the next morning to delay the Yankees, because although Lee's men fortify this line, uh, it is completely uh, vulnerable to being turned. Uh, the, its left flank is completely in the air, and although its right flank is anchored on Pony Mountain, that's just a couple of miles north of the Rapidan and the Federals were to slide down, uh, they could turn the rebel right and get between Lee uh, and the Rapidan River, which of course would be disastrous. Uh, fortunately, Meade does not understand the extent 
uh, to which the strategic advantage is now shifted in his direction. So he spends the night of the 7th uh, sending troops over to reinforce French and the uh, day of the 8th uh, getting his army over the river, uniting it uh, and advancing on Brandy Station uh, with the 6th and the 3rd Corps, expecting that this is where Lee would make a stand and fight. Uh, and of course, Lee has declined to do that. Uh, he's pulled back. And so the Federals spend most of the 8th uh, is simply widening their bridgehead across the Rappahannock, and no federal unit moves more than five or six miles that day, and most of them move far less. Uh, at three o'clock, the Union Army uh, has managed to uh, get itself to Brandy Station. Uh, over here on the left flank, uh, John Buford's division of cavalry is marching down from Rixieville uh, toward the Confederate uh, left flank, but it runs into a brigade of North Carolinians under Brigadier General Lane who, who give it a bloody nose and stop its advance. Uh, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, the Meade, who has interrogated Confederate prisoners who claim that Lee's army had retreated the night before across the Rapidan, uh, Meade accepts those stories, uh, although it's hard to understand why, uh, and he puts his army into camp. Uh, with a couple of hours of daylight left and the Confederate Army only three miles away. If Meade had kept moving, he would have found Lee in position, and although he wouldn't have had enough daylight to make a serious attack on Lee's line, he could have at least uh, ensnared the Confederates in the beginning of a battle that would have either required them to, to stand and fight on incredibly bad ground uh, the next day or uh, to make a rapid retreat to the Rapidan and leave a substantial rear guard behind that Meade could have thrown the whole Army of the Potomac against and probably destroyed. But Meade had gambled uh, by launching this attack at Rappahannock Station, Kelly's Ford. Uh, he had not been sure uh, his gambit would succeed, uh, so he has, in fact, accomplished far more than he thought, and having played for limited stakes, he's willing to stop his army uh, at Brandy Station and leave Lee well uh, enough alone, uh, which of course is going to allow Lee to retreat across uh, the Rapidan that night and back into his old earthworks uh, from August and uh, September, uh, so that uh, by the middle of November, the armies are basically in the same place that they had been at, uh, in September of 1863 and where they had been at the start uh, of the uh, Bristow Station campaign. So it has been a successful uh, offensive uh, for me. Uh, the cost, not too bad, 96 dead, 409 wounded, 11 missing, most of those in, in Russell's division, uh, which suffered uh, considerably in the attack at Rappahannock Station. The Confederates overall, 21 dead, 181 wounded, 1,939 missing, 1,600 of those from Hoax and Hayes brigades. Uh, which had been defending the bridgehead. So tactically, it was a great Union victory. It got a lot of plaudits from the rest of the Army and the press, but strategically, it accomplished far less than it might have done had Sedgwick taken advantage of the several opportunities he had to uh, flatten the Confederate bridgehead earlier in the day, uh, and if Meade had realized uh, how much the situation had shifted in his favor, uh, after the loss of the bridgehead, and he had moved, therefore, more aggressively uh, on uh, the morning of November 8th. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it is a successful offensive campaign. Uh, Lincoln was uh, delighted to see Meade showing this kind of aggressiveness, uh, telegraphed a hearty well done to the general. Uh, but now that Meade has managed to leap the upper Rappahannock, he's shown that he can attack uh, successfully that he can overcome Confederate earthworks. This just raises the bar uh, for the Army of the Potomac, which is now expected to continue the offensive, uh, and that is going to set the stage for the upcoming Mine Run campaign, which will begin at the end of November and continue on into the first days of December 1863. And if you would like to uh, purchase a signed copy of uh, one of my books, you can certainly feel free to email me. Uh, obviously, they're also available from SavasBaby.com 
and uh, most of them are still available at amazon.com as well. Wow, that was really, really great. Um, I learned a lot about that <laughs> that campaign there. And it's really cool because a lot of times in 1863, they get really over overshadowed with Gettysburg and Vicksburg. So it's so neat that you've taken on an interest with some of those campaigns uh, more toward the end of the year. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your expertise with us. I'm sure the chat is full of comments. So I'm um, sure that You'll be welcome to jump on there and see if you can get some con some questions answered for these folks. Sure. And thank you to everyone who watched tonight. Um, thank you for supporting the Historical Society. You um, are helping us to keep the programs um, every week. We have them every Thursday night. And thank you for those that donated. Uh, that, of course, is going to help us out a long way. Um, just, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. And we'll see you next week for another Thursday night program. Jeffrey, thank you again so very much. My pleasure. Good to be with you again.